Well, I'm getting a lot of positive comments about the live streaming, especially from the Skeptics Forum we had last week. I actually took a couple of questions from the live stream audience, and uh, they're hoping we're going to be able to do that here. Although I think it's important to give this class the priority. So one rule I'm going to suggest is that we take a maximum of just two questions uh, from uh, the virtual world. And so if there's a good question coming out there, let us know, but it's going to be limited to two. And if that's too much, let me know. We can limit it to one, but I think we'll try with two and to see how that goes. But yeah, we're getting some very good uh, feedback on that. Thank you for uh, the class that you led on navigating uh, Genesis. I can tell you did a really good job just because they were engaged. Uh, very engaged. And uh, I see Ross Hoagland somewhere here in this class. There he is. Yep. Ross, how many groups have you taken through Navigating Genesis so far? Four. Four groups. Yeah. So hey, just because you've done it once doesn't mean you can't do it again. And whenever I've taken a group through, I always try to challenge people in the group. You can launch your own group. They say, well, I can't do this. Says, yeah, all you need to do is turn on the DVD player. Because <laughs> uh, basically, it teaches itself. So. I uh, encourage you to, to take advantage of that. Dr. Ross, I yes. missed your program yesterday. Well, uh, I'm sorry to hear that. Uh, I was on the Moody uh, Broadcasting Network yesterday morning. And, uh, you know, uh, sorry you weren't able to make that. I was going to give a brief report on how that went. It was an hour-long uh, debate on the age of the Earth. And uh, the fellow I was debating was the one that uh, funded and wrote the script for uh, is uh, Genesis history. So, uh, and uh, you know, I did get to see the, the DVD ahead of time, so, and I also had a two hour conversation with uh, that gentleman, Tom Porporoy, actually before the uh, uh, theater release of the movie. And uh, I mean, he is a very convinced young earth creationist. He's got a history degree and uh, I found out uh, in the debate that he actually wrote the script. So I was wondering why these scientists and theologians that he was interviewing, people I know, uh, were you know, saying things I didn't think they would say, but evidently it was all scripted. So uh, in fact, uh, one of the young earth creationists that was interviewed, uh, Paul Nelson, actually after the movie was released, uh, he posted an article basically saying, uh, they misrepresented me because uh, what disturbed him and I know Paul Nelson unlike most young earth creationists he's friendly towards those of us have an old earth perspective and uh, he says what the movie did is it presented a false dichotomy basically saying you the viewer have two choices young earth creationism or evolution it's like he didn't offer any other alternatives I, I was pleased that Paul actually pointed that out that was good <laughs> Uh, but I also saw several other false dichotomies that the only way you can read Genesis's history is from a young earth perspective. And all of you in the class know we definitely teach it, uh, that it is historical. <laughs> and uh, in fact, what was interesting is Tom claimed there's no way you can do this, uh, keep it as history from an older perspective because you've got the sun showing up uh, after uh, plants on the fourth day. And I said, well, uh, go back to Genesis 1-2. It gives you the frame of reference for the six creation days. And, uh, you know, your issue is that you have the frame of reference above the clouds. If it's below the clouds, the sun's not created on the fourth day. It's created before the six days. And the sun's light becomes visible on day one. And notice the text says, let there be light. It doesn't say God created the light. Now, it's quick to add, I do believe that God created the light. But that was Genesis 1-1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And it was interesting to understand how many young earth creationists actually don't recognize that the phrase, the heavens and the earth, shamayen arrests in the Hebrew with a definite article, means the whole universe of matter, energy, space, and time. It's not the stars plus the earth. It's actually a phrase that's used for the whole universe based on the fact that in Biblical Hebrew, there is no single word for the universe. And incidentally, Biblical Hebrew, because of its small vocabulary, frequently will use phrases 
for things in English that we have a single word for. And so every time in the Bible it says the heavens and the earth, it's referring to the totality of physical reality. It's used nine times in the Old Testament and is never isolating the earth. It's always focusing on everything, all, the, all matter, energy, space and time, stars, galaxies, light, electromagnetism, gravity, everything is all included uh, in that term. You will see a contrasting phrase, heaven and earth. That shows up 19 times in the Old Testament without the definite article. It says heaven and earth. And that's a reference to the whole physical universe plus the spiritual realm where the angels dwell, where God operates. So it's basically a, a bigger term than just the universe. Heaven and earth means all of the universe plus everything in the spirit realm that God has created. Yes? In your debate, how was his attitude? Well, um, it was a lot better than the two-hour private conversation I had with him. Because <laughs> the two-hour private conversation I had with him, and I was basically trying to appeal him and say, look, if you're going to release this movie, at least let the audience know there's more than two positions. Because I heard it was going to be presenting Young Earth versus Evolution. And he, his, he was quite insistent, well, those are the only two real options that you've got. I mean, I'll tell you some of the more false dichotomies I saw. You know, one was that uh, you can only see Genesis' history from a Young Earth perspective. And interestingly, I don't think you can see this history from a Young Earth perspective. It's got real problems trying to look at Genesis' history from a Young Earth perspective. From the very fact that he pointed out, you've got plants in their perspective before the sun exists. Well, how do you keep the plants warm? Now, in debates I've had with them, they said, well, God shines light on the earth, and that's what keeps the plants going. And I said, well, I could see God shining his Shekinah glory upon the earth before the sun, and that would provide light. But you know, it's got to also provide heat, and it's got to be just the right electromagnetic uh, spectrum uh, coming out of that Shekinah glory, because after all, you've got to sustain this photosynthesis. But it's also got to be artificial gravity, because you can't really sustain the Earth and its life without the gravity of the sun. And now you've got the problem. At one point, God takes away his Shekinah glory with the gravity embedded in it by some weird means. And then you've got to replace that with the sun and all the other planets. And that can't disturb light that's already existing on the Earth. So <coughs> moving God, well, God can do anything. He can. Uh, but there's nothing in the biblical text that says that God intervened and put a sun in place where there was no sun. Or as I've pointed out in my book, uh, A Matter of Days, the young earth model is really a two sun model. Because the sun, that the light that they got up until the fourth day has to be identical to all the characteristics of the sun. So you can call it God's Shekinah glory, but physically it must manifest all the attributes of the sun. And then you have this sun number one for the first three creation days, then you'd have God taking away that A and replacing the sun we have right now. And that seems a bit contrived. Uh, and again, there's nothing in the Bible that suggests that God ever did that. Yes? I'm curious what their answer would be to the following chronology. Adam is 4004 B.C. according to the Bible. Okay, so if you use the uh, genealogies as contiguous, meaning there's no gaps, uh, you get down to uh, Noah and the flood. Well, Noah got out of the flood at the end of the flood at the year t around 2358 uh, hmm, That means 30,000 species of animals, which they tend to use that number that could be on the ark, instantaneously evolved into millions of species by the time of Abraham, which was only two or three hundred years later. <laughs> and the population couldn't expand in 300 years to Abraham's time to millions of people. How do they deal with that? Well, that's actually going to be coming out, I mean, yeah, I did this debate, but at the very end of the debate, I told the audience, there's a four views coming out. So you won't be getting this false dichotomy if there's only two positions. 
you're actually going to see a four views book written by the president of uh, BioLogos, representing evolutionary creationism, uh, the president of Answers in Genesis, that's Young Earth Model, uh, the president of the Discovery Institute, uh, Steve Meyer, representing the intelligent design movement's position, and then yours truly got to represent the old Earth view. And uh, that was the subject of what was there. And what I liked about this book is coming out from um, Zondervan, and they did everything they could to try to maintain a gracious tone uh, throughout the book. Uh, but that subject did come up. And I knew ahead of time how young Earth creations respond to it, but you'll actually see this. I said, we're not advocating evolution, we're advocating diversification. However, their definition of diversification is indistinguishable from the definition of you know, a Darwinian type evolutionary uh, process. And yeah, you're making a good point. And this has been brought up by several atheists, some of which I cite in a matter of days, where they basically said the degree of biological evolution that is needed to sustain the young earth position <coughs> is tens of thousands, if not billions of times more aggressive than anything we atheists have ever proposed. Because of the fact of how rapidly you gotta get all these. But the young earth response is the saying, we believe Noah took on board the ark two of every kind. But each kind would be a family or an order. And so, for example, there would be a single cat pair on board the ark. And after the flood, the single cat pair rapidly evolves into all the feline species we see in the face of the earth. And likewise, there would be a single horse type that would be on board the ark. And after the flood, that single horse type would rapidly evolve into zebras um, and uh, you know, donkeys, uh, horses, and all the other uh, equian type uh, creatures. Um, so, but yeah, it's still very aggressive. And of course, they claim that there's no carnivores until after the flood. And so you have these animals rapidly evolving, uh, carnivorous. And they claim, for example, well, they had teeth. Uh, like carnivores before the flood, but they're eating vegetables. And then after the flood, they just use that same teeth to eat animals. But what they're overlooking is this. It's not just the claws and the teeth. A far more challenging problem is the fact that the intestinal tract of the predators is radically different than that of the herbivores. And so you really are looking at a radically different animal. You know, for example, uh, the shark, uh, a third of the body weight of the shark is its liver. Because after all, it's eating predominantly fat. And so it needs this gigantic liver to be able to process its extremely high animal fat diet. And uh, you know, uh, likewise, all the cats. The cats are not capable of eating a vegetarian diet. So a dog can. I mean, you can kind of feed a dog you know, concentrated uh, rice, uh, dog, uh, biscuits, and uh, it can make it uh, because it has a longer digestive tract than the cat. But if you give a cat a purely vegetarian diet, it will die. It needs meat. Well, so, a couple things. I think, as you well know, but a lot of people aren't aware that they maintain that the diversification, if you want to call it that, of the animals after the flood was by totally natural means. That's correct. God rested from his creation activity in the first week of Genesis, so it was by evolutionary means. Well, to push their argument, they actually argue that God designed these kinds with a super genome that was designed to rapidly diversify into thousands of different species. Now, Buzz Rana has commented on that in a couple of articles that he read, is that they, they're overlooking the genetic impossibility of having this kind of super genome that could rapidly diversify without causing widespread extinction. So, mm -hmm. and but the Egyptian Empire was in the 2300. Well, okay. That. One thing I brought up because I mean, uh, Tom Porporoy was not aware that I personally debated a lot of the young Earth creationist scientists that uh, he had interviewed, and that's one reason I quickly picked up this must have been scripted uh, because. Uh, the ones I knew all admit that the science is overwhelmingly against their position. And yet when they were interviewed for this uh, theater movie, 
they were basically implying all the science is on our side. And so, and my comment was, you know, you can do, and the movie came across as a documentary, and it's like, you can do that in a documentary if no one is disputing your conclusions. Now, it was quite appropriate for some expert to be interviewed in a documentary and say, this is the way it is. However, it's considered uh, unethical, if not dishonest, if you're promoting a view that just doesn't have uh, any disputed, to always represent, well, there is another position. And that was never done in the movie. It wasn't even done in the theology. And I was quite surprised they interviewed uh, uh, this theologian. And I think he was taken out of context as well, because he was basically saying the only way to read the creation days in Genesis 1 is that they're 24 hours. And I've never heard a younger theologian say that. They all admit there's different ways. They just say theirs is the best way. But they basically were saying there's only one possibility. And so, yeah, the movie is fraught with false dichotomies. At the very end, I heard they're going to do a sequel. Uh, this guy has lots of money, so he's going to be bringing out a sequel where they're basically going to kind of push the point that, hey, all the science is on the side of the young earth position. And because it was a very short one-hour debate and there was ads that had to run and you get cut off a lot, I didn't have the opportunity to make the point you know, in debates I personally have had uh, with young earth creationist scientists, there was two of those debates where the moderator asked this question. Do you know if any scientist who's ever been persuaded that there's credibility to the young earth position <coughs> independent of a Bible interpretation? And though the debates, that's with Dwayne Gish and John Morris, and both of them said no. And the moderator came back with Dwayne Gish says, hey, you've been doing this for 40 years. I mean, in the 40-year period, you can't name or think of a single one. He says, no, I can't. <coughs> and the moderator said, look, I don't know anything about the science, but I know right away this position does not have scientific credibility because there'd be at least one who, independent of a Bible interpretation, had drawn that position. Yes? Did they touch at all on scripturally that Adam, before the fall, Again, it was uh, just a one-hour debate, and we probably addressed that subject for all of 20 seconds. So, yeah, and then the subject got changed. So, no, we were not able to go uh, that far uh, with that. Or the fact that uh, this is in a matter of days, is that they make the claim, we're not talking species, we're talking biblical kinds. But what's interesting is that the Hebrew word min that's translated as kind actually is defined exactly how broadly that can go. So, for example, uh, in, I think it's in uh, Exodus and Leviticus, it talks about six different kinds of owls, which means that the definition, at least as it applies to birds, is really as narrow as a scientific definition for a species, if not narrower. However, you will find, again, this is in the Torah, I'm trying to remember the exact text, I think it's Leviticus, uh, actually names four different kinds of winged insects. And there it's using a broader term, a term that's as broad as a genus. So based on the biblical examples, maybe you could push the boundary of a biblical kind as far as a genus uh, for insects, but for birds and presumably mammals as well, it'd be as narrow as the equivalent of the definition for a species which means it's not God just taking a single pair from each order or family and filling out the entire thing through rapid, quote, diversification. But we never got to discuss that. Uh, but I did get to dialogue with that in some uh, televised debates we've done, and it's in the book A Matter of Days. Yeah, but, but Adam gives names to like the law. He does, yeah. I mean, yeah, there's, there's good reputations to this. So... But you know, the real core of this uh, discussion I had yesterday was over the issue of death. Uh, because the moderator is saying, well, you know, this really isn't a salvation issue, uh, but your passion, referring to the young earth defendant, these, you must think this is a very important doctrine. He says, yes, I do. Because 
in Hugh's perspective, you got plants and animals dying uh, before Adam sins. That besmirches the character of God. And he actually tries to tie the doctrine of atonement into the death of these animals. And so we talked a little bit about that and uh, basically said, well, the biblical text simply rules out human death that doesn't rule out plant and animal death. And he did concede that point. He says, yeah, the Bible is silent on it, but just based on what we know about uh, God and the Bible, there couldn't have been any plant and animal death uh, before uh, Adam. And my response was, well, God wanted to redeem billions of human beings in a short period of time. That requires a lot of bio deposits. Tens of quadrillions of tons of bio deposits are necessary for billions of human beings to be redeemed in a short period of time. And we have that thanks to the death of plants and animals and other life forms taking place over billions of the years. So there's a question here, yes. Then I'll come back to you. Uh, real briefly. In terms of uh, evangelism, uh, when I'm online debating with, not debating, but sharing with atheists, they think they're debating me. I have to spend so much time, you know, just dispelling this reputation that Christians have of believing all this young earth stuff, you know? I mean, it seems like you almost have to throw out almost all of science to believe this. Well, and let me so give I you. I appreciate what you're doing. Let me give you an extreme example of that, Doug, but it's actually fairly common. I was doing a debate with an atheist uh, quantum uh, chemist, quantum physicist, at the University of Alberta, Calgary. This was quite a few years ago. And I got to speak first, and I kind of laid out, you know, here is the scientific evidence for the God of the Bible. And then when the uh, atheist quantum physicist got up, he basically said, Everything you hear Hugh is saying, he doesn't believe. I know he's uh, a committed Christian. He believes the Bible is the error free word of God. Therefore, he can't believe what he's saying. He really is a young earth creationist. <laughs> <laughs> and so he spent his 30 minutes explaining why young earth creationism is scientific uh, nonsense. And, uh, but fortunately, I had a chance to respond and say, you know, I really do believe. <laughs> Uh, that this and that, you know, the younger creations are really, from my perspective, uh, misreading the Bible. But it does show you. Uh, and he kept insisting to the audience, Hugh must be younger because he takes the Bible seriously. And he's a serious Christian. And so you're right, Doug, there is this widespread perception that if you take the Bible seriously, you have to be reading it from a younger perspective. And this is where I appreciate the scholarship of Gleason Archer. Uh, you know, the famous uh, linguist and theologian, where he basically argued it's not possible to defend an inerrant Bible from a young earth perspective. And that the problem, and I got to say this yesterday, I said, you know, it's not enough to take the Bible literally, we have to take it literally and consistently. There's 66 <coughs> books in the Bible, and how we're going to biblically resolve this age of the earth issue is by looking at all the biblical texts. <coughs> And the moderator said, give me an example. I said, well, the one I gave here in the class, Jeremiah 33. The laws that govern the heavens and the earth are fixed. They don't change. We look at the whole chapter. God says to the Jews, you're always changing your mind. I never change. I am immutable. As proof that I'm immutable and changeless, look at the laws that govern the heavens and the earth. As they don't change, I don't change. And her comment is, what has that got to do with this age of the earth? And I says, well, talk to any young earth creationists. And you've actually heard it uh, here today. Uh, all young earth models depend on radically altered laws of physics, either at the fall or the flood, or typically both. And we're not just talking a slight adjustment. We're talking adjustment in the case of the flood of a factor of a billion times. And they all admit that that poses a problem for them. And, uh, you know, Marcus Ross was interviewed in this uh, 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 theater release movie. And I had a chance to uh, dialogue with him and debate him publicly uh, when I was in Missouri. And he points out, yes, we got big problems with our global flood model because we have to have the radiometric decay rates about a billion times faster for a five-month period. And there's a lot of potassium in the bodies of human beings and all other life forms. 
and that potassium decays a million times faster, then that's going to incinerate the bodies of every animal on the face of the planet. And uh, never mind the uranium and thorium we got in our bodies. So, uh, but anyway, interesting time, and we did take a couple of questions. Interestingly, an astrophysicist called in with his question, and he said, "You know, tell me about the craters on the moon." And you know, he was making a good argument that you can't really explain the craters on the moon from a young Earth perspective. Unfortunately, he didn't have time to unpack his whole point, and he was assuming that everybody knew enough of the physics of crater formation that they were following his argument. And you know, kind of typical of a lot of my astrophysicist friends, they assume that lay people know too much. <laughs> so, but uh, it is a powerful argument because of the fact that we can actually see that the craters on the moon are eroded. You can actually see the erosion. In fact, by measuring the erosion, we can tell when those craters have formed. And the forces of erosion on the moon are orders and orders of magnitude less than they are on the Earth. And so when you see a heavily eroded crater, in fact, 95% of the craters we see in the moon were formed 3.9 billion years ago. That's where we get our evidence for what's called the late heavy bombardment. The fact that we can see in the moon that almost all the craters were formed at a particular epoch, and consequently planet Earth took 30 times the damage that the moon took because of her bigger gravitational signature, which is a huge part of our origin of life uh, model and reasons to believe. But it's thanks to the craters on the moon, we're able to figure that out. And also, the moon's got an argon atmosphere. You know, when potassium decays, it makes argon. And all the argon only comes from potassium decay. And so for the moon to have an argon atmosphere, it had to be there a long, long time. Otherwise, there'd be no argon there if it was only 10,000 years old, because of how slowly potassium decayed. Yes? And Young could come to you. I didn't forget you. Hugh, what is the name of the movie? Is uh, Genesis History. Is Genesis History. And they're coming up with a sequel. And I've heard there's another Young Earth movie that's going to be released tomorrow in uh, theaters, uh, tomorrow and Thursday. I'm probably not going to get to see it because i got to get on an airplane and uh, head to uh, Rhode Island uh, to speak at a conference. You had a question? Exactly the same question. Yeah. What's the name of the movie? Yeah. What's the name of the movie? Is Genesis. You, you can watch it on uh, uh, Netflix. Okay, I just hadn't heard that mentioned <coughs> all day here. So Sorry. Up. No, it had a two-day theater release. Uh, a couple of months ago, uh, maybe longer than that, uh, but recently. And uh, yeah, now I hear they're uh, doing a sequel to it. So. Do you know what the response was? Well, the theaters were packed, but they're basically packed with younger creationists. So they're basically hearing what they wanted to hear. Uh, but I think what's unfortunate is they're basically hearing all the theology is on our side, all the science is on our side, all the scientists out there don't know what they're talking about. And uh, oh, I shouldn't say this. I'm, like, I'm going to cut it off right there because I was going to say something personal, but I won't. Yeah. Okay? <laughs> so, but yeah, I'll, I'll just close with this. The real heart of our debate yesterday is a good God would not let plants and animals die unless it could be blamed on human sin. And uh, you know, theologically, that's got a problem for me. It's like, you mean to tell me that God is handcuffed because of our human actions? If this is the all-powerful God, and if this is such a horrible thing from his perspective, uh, why would he be uh, taken back or put on surprise uh, because of a human response? After all, we're just a creature, and uh, he would know what we're going to do anyway. Uh, but you know, the point I've already made is it's thanks to the death of plants and animals that billions of us can be redeemed in a short period of time. And given the laws of physics, there really is no other way. But I do find it frustrating when I dialogue with these younger creationists. They think physical death is bad in all contexts. And it's like, if that's the case, God would have given us access to the tree of life. But notice what happened when Adam and Eve sinned. God sent two powerful angels with flaming swords to block access to the tree of life. Why? lest they live forever physically. You see, theologically, what's going on there? If we humans had gotten access to that tree of life, 
we would have lived forever physically and have been spiritually dead for all eternity. <coughs> because God took away access to the tree of life, God now was able to use our physical death as a tool to redeem us from something far worse, spiritual death. And it's thanks to physical death, a pathway has been opened up uh, for the redemption of human beings. And if we think that death is bad in all contexts, how do you explain the fact that God, before he created anything, chose that his own son would die on the cross on behalf of all of us? So before God created anything, the physical death of the creator of the universe was already put on the calendar. This is what we're going to do. The God had agreed to this plan before they created anything at all. Moreover, as you read the New Testament, especially in the epistles, you see the repeated point to the human uh, species. If you want to truly live, the only way you can truly live is to die. And so coming to Christ is basically agreeing to die to self so that you can live eternally. And so death is a pathway to life. And in that sense, I think we're mistaken to say that death is evil in all contexts. Uh, I think there was someone here that had a question. If not, I'll go to you. Go ahead. How do they respond to one? Scripture says that God provides the lion his meat. Uh, the ravens their meat. Uh, if death was a sin and God's engaged in sinful activity, uh, plus before the fall, what did he uh, remove all the aphids from all the vegetation before the brontosaurus could eat tons of these things? I mean, how ridiculous do you get? I mean, what point do you... Well, what I've heard from my young earth friends is they'll say things, well, we're not talking plants, because plants really aren't alive. So they differ on the uh, Yeah, so uh, it's basically just the animals we're talking about. And then they'll say, well, just the higher animals, the animals that can feel pain. Because after all, God would never uh, cause any creature to experience pain. And therefore, and they would claim things like uh, cockroaches don't experience pain, frogs don't experience pain. However, there's abundant scientific evidence that they do. Cockroaches, I could believe it. <laughs> <laughs> well, there are papers I cite in a matter of days making the point that they've done experiments on frogs, and uh, they experience fish and frogs. So, you know, when you take that hook out of a frog, it feels pain. So, um, and, you know, likewise the frog. And it, they basically feel it to the same degree we do, with one exception. They don't anticipate it. And this is something I think we need to be careful about. You can't interpret the pain of an animal uh, from a human perspective, because we know pain is coming. I mean, it's called, called the dentist effect, right? <laughs> <laughs> when you go to the dentist, you anticipate that you're going to experience pain, and it makes the pain much worse. It's the anticipation of pain <coughs> that makes the pain worse. And animals typically don't anticipate pain. In fact, my son had to take his dog to the vet this morning. Um, and, you know, the dog had a, quite a terrible uh, urinary tract infection. And I uh, was going through pain. But it's like my son's comment is, my dog just isn't responding. And I said, well, dog is not like you. If you had the same problem, you'd be in agony. Moreover, you'd be in agony thinking, I've got to go to the hospital, I know what I'm in for. Uh, your dog doesn't know what he's in for, and so is able to respond to the situation uh, with a lot more uh, calmness than you would as a human being. So, yes. Um, you, this is a kind of a, something I saw in the windowsill in my uh, studio. Um, the spider and the fly. Spider had his web uh, already made, and the fly was on the opposite side of the uh, of the windowsill. So the um, spider went over, and he would sting the fly, and then he would go back, and he continued to do this until the fly stopped wiggling, moving, and then he wrapped him up in right. thing and took him back into the. Um, so the spider must have been smarter than the fly. Is, is that correct? <laughs> Yeah, I would say that. <laughs> At least that particular fly. <laughs> that particular fly. Anyway, it was fun to watch that. <laughs> yeah. And, well, this is something, too, is if you go back 150 years, 
you don't see this young earth, old earth debate over death like we do today. In fact, our uh, scholars at Reasons Believe have said it's basically an urban phenomenon. Uh, the young earth creationists that take this perspective, they, they've been born, raised, and educated in big metropolitan cities, uh, whereas people who live on the farms and out there in the rural areas, they recognize how essential it is that there be the process of physical death. I mean, if you don't thin out uh, the uh, deer, for example, their death rate's going to go up. And that's what the, the carnivores do. And the carnivores are very efficient. They only hunt the sick, the wounded, and the dying, uh, or the crippled. And this actually in increases the health of the herd and actually increases the population. So I've gotten to say this in a couple of debates. You take away carnivorous activity, the death rate will skyrocket. And there's lots of documented evidence of what happens, especially in Australia. Yes? You mentioned the tree of life, and that's an interesting thing. I don't know if you've written on that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I do. I comment on that in a matter of days, making the point that uh, Romans 8 makes it clear, and that actually came up in the debate yesterday because he was basically misinterpreting Romans 8. Uh, he left out a phrase, and frequently I see that with my young earth friends. They'll quote a Bible text, but they leave out a key phrase. And uh, the phrase he was leaving out is that creation is subject to the law of decay. And he was implying it, uh, it's subject now, but it wasn't before, and it won't be later. Well, if you actually read the passage, um, 18 to 22, it says the entire creation was subject to the law of decay. And again, in the context of Jeremiah 33, the law of decay has been continuously in effect from the very beginning of cosmic creation. There's always been decay at the same rate it is now, otherwise we wouldn't be able to live. I mean, the idea that you could digest food without a pervasive law of decay. I mean, you've got an engineering degree. What you learn in engineering is, you know, life vitally depends on the law of entropy being continuously in operation. And so Adam and Eve were under the law of decay before they sinned. And uh, likewise, they're experiencing pain. Uh, and the Bible actually has some passages where it talks about what it's like when you don't experience pain. You know, lepers. The problem with leprosy is you lose your sensation to pain. And that's, you know, when you look at lepers who have lost limbs, it's not because the disease caused those limbs to drop. It's because they lost their pain sensation in those limbs and wound up doing injury uh, to those limbs to such a degree that the limb basically uh, was decayed and gone. And so I've actually seen people with that disease say, well, give me a jar. I'll get that lid off. They don't use a wrench because they experience no pain. But then you see this huge bloodied scar <coughs> on their hand because they really basically don't experience any pain. My position on the tree of life is that here's Adam and Eve in the garden, and they're enjoying life. But after about 20 years, they begin to notice, gee, uh, our bodies are a little bit decayed and it's actually causing us uh, some discomfort. Let's go to that tree of life, and it's basically kind of like taking a pill that reverses all the effects of thermodynamics. So in other words, this tree of life basically uh, would kind of renew things. It actually says that in Revelation 21, how there'll be a tree of life for the new nations that God will create in the new creation, and it will be a healing thing, or it will be able to reverse the impact of the law of decay. And so without access to the tree of life, uh, there's no reversing the law of decay. Or think of it this way. Uh, you take your car into the shop, and they basically fix your car so it's just like it was when it was brand new. That's kind of like the tree of life uh, from my theological perspective. So is this something physically you know, realizable, or is this a miraculous thing? That, and do you have any comments on what this could actually could have been? And whether it's well, I think there's something supernatural yeah. about the tree of yeah. life, because it basically uh, reversed uh, the effects of thermodynamics on the, on, on the human body. There's nothing in there to indicate that it would work for any non-human animal, evidently. And you could claim it does, but there's nothing that would say it would go beyond 
So if your dog went there, I'm not sure it's going to restore your dog to its pristine condition. But evidently, it works on humans. And that theological perspective tells us that Adam and Eve must have sinned relatively quickly. Because if it had been 50 years, they would have gone to the tree of life. But evidently, uh, the time between them being created and their rebelling against God's authority was short enough that they didn't notice any decay in their human body. And that's something you see in 2 Corinthians 4. 2 Corinthians 4 says every one of us as human beings is living under the decay of our physical bodies. But it says if you've got the Holy Spirit permanently indwelling you, that Holy Spirit is kind of like the tree of life. It's transforming it. And what Paul says in 2 Corinthians 4.16, if you're walking in the power of the Holy Spirit, people will notice that Spirit transforming your life day by day. In a single day, they will notice a change. Now, not all of us are walking that way continually, but I'm sure those of you who are believers have recognized when you've met someone or you've actually seen a dramatic change in their spirit literally in one day. Uh, I've seen it with brand new believers, but I've also seen it with people who have been walking with the Lord for decades, where literally in a day you can see this transformation. And it's encouraging because our bodies don't decay in a single day. It takes years before we notice, gee, I'm not walking as fast as I used to. I can't do the stuff I used to do. And I don't look the same as I used to. Uh, but it takes years before you notice that accumulated effect. But the spirit can be a single day. And but basically Paul exhorts us, live your lives in such a way that every single day people can see that you're being transformed. That's what's exciting about being a Christian facing physical death. We can be thrilled about the prospect of a future physical death because whatever is happening to us physically is being far outweighed by what is happening spiritually. And so we can rejoice. That's what it says in 2 Corinthians 4. If you're walking with the Lord, you can rejoice in your old age. Old age is exciting because of what's happening to you spiritually. Totally overwhelms what's going on physically. Yeah, I mean... We're happy. You're happy, <laughs> all those of you who are over the age of 50, aren't you excited? <laughs> or I should put it this way, all of you who have been walking with the Lord for more than 10 years have probably really seen this happen. You know, married couples, where they've both been walking with the Lord for more than 10 years, you can actually be more excited about your spouse than you were when you first got married. To me, that's a sign of a really good Christian marriage, where every anniversary is better than the last anniversary. In fact, I'm going to get to do a wedding uh, this coming Saturday. And one of the messages I give when I officiated a wedding is my prayer for you is that uh, your first anniversary will be a sign, your first year as a married couple will be your worst year as a married couple. <laughs> and every year afterwards is going to get better and better and better. And so whatever happens in your first year, if you're committed to walk with the Lord, that's going to be your worst year of marriage. Oh, new married couple right here. <laughs> I hope I'm not discouraging you. Do you have an opinion view on whether the tree of life was a one-time thing or was it something you would have had to have gone back to regularly? Well, the text doesn't say. So, uh, yeah, I mean, a lot of Bible interpreters have figured it out that way, that the tree of life was something you only had to go to once, and that means you'd be living forever in a perfectly uh, physical state, or it was something you had to go back to repeatedly. In other words, you eat of the tree of life, it would reverse all the damage of the laws of physics in your body up to that point. You could live another 10 years, and you say, well, I think I better go back to that tree of life and uh, you know, get another shot. Uh, but that's an open debate within the Christian community. How would that have mitigated accidental death? I mean, if somebody fell 100 feet, how would the tree of life protect the death? That's also another debate. Uh, if you took of the tree of life, would that guarantee you wouldn't die from an accident or get shot in a battle? Uh, or does it just simply reverse the effects of thermodynamics in your body up to that point, in which case you would have the potential and you kind of see that, I don't know if you've ever looked at that, uh, what's that series book called, uh, The Lord of the Rings, where they have the elves, 
uh, that can live forever if they don't go to battle. Yeah. If they go to battle, then they can die. So, so you can see that debate even within the Christian novels. Yes. Yeah, back on the tree of life, God being omniscient, why did he bother making a tree of life if he knew he would never use it? Well, I think it was for humanity's benefit. And I was wishing I had a chance to share that yesterday, is that we human beings, in fact, it says that in 1 Corinthians 15, how physical death we view as with fear and as an enemy. And uh, so I think one reason why God may have put the tree of life in the garden was basically to communicate to humanity, I got things under control. Uh, you're going to live forever no matter what. Um, and, you know, because we tend to look at death as something very painful. So, I mean, who really looks forward to death? We all know it's not going to be a pleasant experience. But that's why I use the race analogy. If you're running a marathon, you're not going to feel good at the end of the marathon. But when you cross that finish line, you're the winner. And likewise, uh, physical death is a graduation ceremony. But, you know, we shouldn't be surprised uh, that that experience of physical death is not going to be pleasant. I have a moon question. A moon question. I, I had heard that the astronauts at the time of the first man on the moon didn't know how deep the dust was on the moon. <coughs> they can have a measured rate of how much is on. And they didn't know if they were going to sink 25 feet in or just a few inches. And that's why I took over manual control. Well, uh, that is a, a young Earth story that's yes. been propagated for, <laughs> gee, 50 years. Most young Earth creationists have now stopped telling that story because they realize it's not credible. Uh, but the birth of the story uh, was uh, a geophysicist, uh, Hans Pedersen. And what he did is he went to Mauna Kea, uh, one of the high mountains of Hawaii, and he put a filter four feet above the top of Mauna Kea. That was before there were telescopes there. It was back in 1960. And he measured the amount of dust going through the filter. And he concluded, if 100% of that dust is cosmic dust, then given the age of the moon, uh, there would be a couple of hundred feet of dust on the moon. And therefore, he said, you know, this is something we need to check before we send people to the moon. Because back in 1960, they were talking about sending people to the moon. And he says, if there's all that dust on the moon's surface, uh, we need to rethink the space program. But what he recommended at the end of the paper was, I did this four feet off the top of a mountain. Uh, before we give this any credence, we need to do high altitude balloon measurements and better yet, satellite measurements. Because after all, that dust may be predominantly Earth dust rather than cosmic dust. And that's how we ended the paper. Now, young Earth creationists conveniently drop out that conclusion from the paper. Because <coughs> what happened long before we sent people to the moon is they actually did those high altitude balloon measurements and satellite measurements and figured out that Hans Pedersen was off by over a factor of a thousand times. And uh, actually, they were able to work out a detailed model because they found out how much, how little of that dust going through his filter was actually cosmic dust. But they also know that he did not take into account ultraviolet breakdown of the lunar surface. And so that would give you more dust. But because his measurements were off by so much, that would drop the dust down. And so long before uh, they landed craft on uh, the moon, they determined that the average thickness of dust on the moon, if it's 4.4 billion years old, would be 60 millimeters. They said if it's 60 millimeters, then there shouldn't be any problem uh, putting craft on the moon and putting astronauts on the moon. And, you know, when Apollo 9 um, mission made it to the moon, uh, you saw the astronauts come down the ladder, walking on the lunar surface, and you saw that their tracks uh, were, in fact, they were right on the nose. It was about 60 millimeters of dust. And so, but if the moon was only thousands of years old, you wouldn't have any dust. So the fact that there was 60 millimeters of dust shows that indeed it must be billions of years old. But to this day, you've got some young Earth creationists saying there was a dust problem uh, with the moon. And uh, so the fact that there isn't hundreds of feet of dust proves that it's young 
Uh, it's quite the opposite. Again, what I tell people is when you hear these claims, actually go to the original source. That paper is still available to be read to this day. That's the wonderful thing about the internet. You don't have to go to a university library. You can go on the internet and actually see the paper that Hans Pedersen wrote. And I give you a link in my book, A Matter of Days. So you can go straight to it. That's something else that's new about publishing. A rule we have at Reason to Believe now, every book we publish has a DOI label that takes you straight to the internet and the article. So that you can actually pop up the book or the article that we're citing and see it for yourself. I mean, that's the amazing thing about the internet. All this stuff is immediately accessible. Now, most of the articles I cite, you will not get the whole paper unless you're willing to shell out 25 bucks. Uh, there's a financial firewall. However, you can always read the abstract of any research paper free of charge. And most journals today, once the paper's older than two years, they make it free to everybody. And yeah, that paper, 1960, it's way older than two years. Okay, in the back. And I'm going to try to get to my lesson, maybe. <laughs> That is the emotional issue, animal death. You're right. They also go to, in the line, the late realm of the land. But it seems like they're really stuck as well on a model of eternity as being a restored Eden. Would you say that's a fair characterization? I actually devoted a chapter to that in a matter of days, making the point that far more serious than our division over the age of the earth and the age of the universe is our division on eschatology. Uh, where they claim now there are a, at least one exception. I do know of one younger creationist leader uh, who does not hold to the idea that eternity will be here on earth. And that what's going to happen is God's going to restore, excuse me, restore this planet to the conditions it had at the time of Adam and Eve before they sinned. Uh, you say that's fair, but most of them hold that view. I know of only one young earth creationist that does not hold that view. So but the one that does not hold that view says, I agree with you, Hugh. This is a very important disagreement because this really does affect how we think about uh, our redemptive reward. Is it going to be this earth or is it going to be a brand new realm? And, uh, you know, he's an astronomer, so he realizes you've got huge difficulties if you're going to try to claim that God's going to have his dwell here on earth uh, for the rest of eternity. Because the physics of our planet and our solar system means that the window of time in which we humans can exist here is rapidly coming to a close. I mean, Stephen Hawking is right when he says, we're going to have to leave this planet because it's not going to sustain us much longer. Now, when he says 100 years, I think that's a bit pessimistic. We could probably last a little longer, but we're not going to last a whole lot longer uh, than 1,000 or 2,000 years, at least at the state of... Uh, uh, technology and affluence we're experiencing right now. And even without technology and affluence, uh, this planet will be uninhabitable for human beings regardless of our population or technology in about 10 million years. And uh, that's not very long from an astronomical perspective. They have a real problem then when they try to read Revelation. A lot of times they just don't even talk about it. Well, I mean, I'm millennial, so I believe when it talks about the lion will lay down with a lamb, that's 1,000 years. That's not talking about the eternal state. I do agree that's here on earth. The lion will lay down with the lamb, and the lion will not eat meat. It won't be predatory. What that tells me, however, is we human beings must be feeding all the predators because they're not going to survive unless we give them a concentrated diet a processed vegetable matter. I mean, you can do that. You can feed a cat. If you take vegetable matter, basically concentrate it, put some appropriate amino acids in it, and they can make it. But you just can't give them, uh, tell them to go eat grass. Uh, they're not going to, I mean, when your dog eats grass, it doesn't digest the grass. No, that's too much. That's to do something else, right? <laughs> And cats will eat grass so that they can throw up. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, dogs too, right? So, that means we have to be processing, which tells us that I do think you're going to see something like the Garden of Eden, where these animals were not afraid of us human beings. And therefore, there's going to be this capacity to bond with these creatures in such a way 
that we'll be able to personally uh, feed them the food they need to be able to subsist uh, without uh, killing other animals. And I've actually seen this at the Algonquin Radio Observatory up in Canada, uh, where uh, you know, it's in an isolated place. It's, I tell Americans, this observatory is a place where we have four seasons, just like you have in the United States. We have two weeks of black flies, two weeks of mosquitoes, <laughs> two weeks of uh, horse flies, and then we got ten and a half months of winter. <laughs> now, it was such uh, a, an isolated place and uh, you know, a challenging place to live that when they hired the cook, number one, the cook was the best paid employee he got paid more, paid more than the director of the observatory. He got paid more than all of us astronomers. But he also said, I'll only work here if I have an unlimited food budget. And we found out he was throwing away half the food that he was preparing. And so the out back of our uh, telescope, there was this huge pile of waste food that the cook <coughs> threw away every day. Well, guess what happened? The predators stopped hunting. And you'd see the predators and the herbivores uh, actually together eating from the pile of food. And they'd be so full that they would play with one another. <laughs> so you'd see these wolves uh, playing with rabbits. And uh, you know, the wolf would catch the rabbit and immediately let the rabbit go. And uh, they, they, it's like they became best friends. Because it, and so the, the conflict you saw between these different animals disappeared because they were eating such high quality food from the cook. <laughs> I mean, the cook was providing them with food way better than anything that they could get, so. And, uh, but yeah, I mean, it was kind of uh, interesting to watch all these animals gathered around, uh, basically enjoying fellowship with one another and, and feeding on that pile. And uh, yeah, I never had to worry about the 600 pound bears, because as long as they're eating, they weren't gonna bother me, so. <laughs> Yeah, when, when I was in Vietnam, we, we had a dump nearby. We, we put the garbage, and tigers would go there and eat out of it. Yeah. So uh, it kept things a little safer for us. It did, yeah. So incidentally, they had to shut down that telescope because uh, the engineers there basically said, well, if the cook gets isolation pay. We want isolation pay. And the government says, we're not going to give it to you. And so they basically shut up the whole observatory. It still ranks as one of the world's best radio telescopes. Mm -hmm. But for over 40 years, it's been mothballed. Mm -hmm. And which tells you, you know, be careful where you put a telescope <laughs> uh, because the support staff may not like to live there. <laughs> and hey, I loved the period of the 10 and a half months of winter because there were no flies biting me. Yeah. <laughs> I hated to go there in summer. That was awful. I want to know how awful and we're running out of time. But I was with this American astronomer once and we were driving a vehicle and it was just this huge cloud of black flies, so thick that you couldn't see outside the windshield. He was going to turn the windshield wiper on. I said, stop, don't do that. Because <laughs> you're going to just have all these squashed black flies there. We're not going to be able to see a thing outside the window. At least now we can see three or four feet out the window. And so just drive very slowly and don't turn on those windshield wipers. You know, Americans can't believe that it ever gets that bad. It really does get that bad. But it only lasts two weeks. Yes? For that facility, maybe the solution is just find cheaper chefs. Find cheaper what? Chefs. Find cheaper chefs. chefs yeah. And the other people won't feel so bad about making them come with the chefs. Well, I'll tell you one little story about that. Because they had to give this uh, chef uh, you know, weeks vacation, and I happened to be on the telescope when the main chef was on vacation. So they brought this guy in for three weeks. So uh, and I was observing 24 hours a day, and it was a six-day run. I was younger back then; I could handle that. I couldn't do that now. Uh, but I remember talking to the cook, saying, "Look, I can't come uh, to the dining hall. I'm going to be stuck at the control desk of the telescope the entire time." And so I need for you to, to make me lunches. And he says, well, how many lunches do you need? Well, I said, I'm going to need five a day because I'm not going to be sleeping. So uh, please, uh, I'm going to need five lunches a day. And I just have them, uh, one of the engineers, bring it. OK, I get on the telescope. I'm on the telescope for two hours. Six days of lunches arrive all at once. <laughs> <laughs> 
And the engineer who's working with me says, tell you what, how about if I trade my lunch for your lunch, sight unseen? Evidently, he'd been there. He knew what was happening. So I said, sure, you can pick any one of my lunches. I'll trade you for your lunch. So he immediately opens up my lunch, and he says, bologna sandwiches. <laughs> and so I looked at all. I had 30, uh, no, it's actually, yeah, uh, 30 lunches there. We opened up every bag. Every bag was bologna sandwiches. <laughs> bologna sandwiches on white bread. That's all I had to eat for that whole week. <laughs> There was almost a riot that broke out at the observatory because they said, you know, can't you get the cook to cut his vacation and come back? <laughs> Pay him extra, whatever you got to do. But we, we can't handle this guy just giving his baloney sandwiches all the time. <laughs> so yeah, for a six-day period, all I had to eat was baloney sandwiches. But what was fun is every time the engineer would come, well, yeah, I would get a different engineer for every ship, and each engineer would say, can I trade? Because they all thought there's no way they're going to give the astronomers the same food we're eating, right? <laughs> so I always would trade with them, and I'd get the same reaction. Oh, no! <laughs> so yeah, you get what you pay for. <laughs> that chef came cheap, but boy, we got what we paid for. <laughs> all right, let's see him out of time. All right, okay. I got a question for you for next week, because you know we're trying to wrap this up get through Ecclesiastes 12. We're actually going to spend some time on Ecclesiastes 11 uh, because it's... So I want you to read all of Ecclesiastes 11 and 12. And I want you to think about applying this in the context of evangelism and apologetics. I mean, you've got phrases like, cast your bread upon the waters. And basically it's saying, diversify your investments. Well, actually what I'm going to suggest is this is a text that's telling us, based on the context of the rest of the book, because I've mentioned, the theme of the book is this is a playbook on how to reach atheists that think there is no God. That's what this whole book is all about. So I want you to interpret Genesis 11 and 12 in that context. Uh, we're really serious. I we're really serious about reaching people who think there is no God. And it's not just atheists. I'd say agnostics are in that category. A lot of deists actually live their lives if there is no God. How are we going to reach these folks? You're going to have to reach them with a diversified portfolio of apologetics tool. So I want you to think about that. And then as we move on, for those of you especially a little bit younger in the class, notice the theme. Remember your creator when you're young. The time to get serious about this is not when you're 50 years of age. The time to get serious about this is when you're 10, 12, 15, 20. And uh, so we're going to get into why it's so important that we give this serious attention when we're young and not wait till we're older. Uh, but we're going to also finish up this theme about how it is God knows all your thoughts and all your motives, and we need to live our lives accordingly. <coughs> I'm going to give you a couple of cross-reference passages to look at, and uh, ones we haven't studied yet, which is basically Hebrews 4, verse 10, Isaiah 40, uh, verse 27, but next week, I got a question for all of you. Because uh, this is all talking about the fact that God not only knows all your thoughts and your motives, He knows your fears and your doubts. And this is a big factor in evangelism and apologetics, identifying the fear and the doubt of people you're talking to. And incidentally, a lot of Christians struggle with fears and doubts. And so I want you to think back in your past. Is there a doubt that you experience that caused you some fear about God's care about your uh, life and his role in your life? And I know every one of you can answer that question with yes, but I'm giving you a whole week to think about. Think of a significant period in your life when a doubt uh, was crippling you in terms of you know, generating fear, anxiety. Maybe fear is not the right word. Did you ever have a doubt that caused you some anxiety? Uh, about your own walk with the Lord, but about your witness. Uh, because when you've got an anxiety like that, it tends to blunt your willingness to engage others with your Christian faith. So I want to hear some testimonies next week. Can you give those passages again, please? Let me give you the passages again. Isaiah 40, uh, verse 27, and then Hebrews 4, 10, and of course Hebrews eleven six, and the passage we're looking at, as 1 Chronicles uh, 29, 
uh, 8, 9, and 10. And then the last two verses of Ecclesiastes, chapter 12, last two verses. And all those texts are basically making a point. We humans think God gets tired and weary and therefore doesn't pay attention to everything that's going on in our life. And these are texts that basically says God rests, but he never gets tired, he never gets weary, he knows everything that's going on in your life. Every second of your life, he knows exactly how you feel. Which is why we've been saying weeks past, don't try to hide your feelings from God. He knows how you feel. Be upfront, be honest, if you've got doubts, you need to tell him. And he wants you to come to you and with your fears and your doubts because he wants to deal with them. When you hide, he can't help you. And so basically the exhortation is, how can we stop hiding from God? Number one, realize, first of all, you can't hide, so why try hiding? That'll be next week. Let me uh, close in prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you for this time we've had in class today. Uh, thank you for all the diversions we had, and Lord, how that's going to equip us to be uh, more effective in sharing our faith with others. We thank you for this wonderful season we're entering into with Thanksgiving and Christmas, opportunities we're going to have like no other time of the year uh, to be a witness for you. So help us to be well prepared. Help us to be gracious and loving with everyone we do engage, that your love, your truth, and life might penetrate hearts into salvation. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you.